Hi guys, welcome back to Simplified. I'm your host Michael and I am Gurjot. This is episode 2. Hey there, this is part 2 of this episode. You can find part 1 on our website. And now, let's begin. So now going into the future, we're trying to find new sources of energy, right? Like ones that would be re- renewable and replace the current limited fossil fuels, for example. Mm-hmm. So bringing your particle physics background here, could you tell us in as simple words as possible, since we do not have a background in particle physics, is nuclear fusion a possibility? Is that a possible... In a feasible time scale. Yeah. Okay, so we know that nuclear fusion happens in the sun and in all the stars. Yes. This is the energy source of the sun. Mm-hmm. And from the physics point of view, we know exactly what is happening there. Mm-hmm. What is happening? In simple terms. Yes, okay. <laughs> just, just kind of. <laughs> so, the sun is absolutely a huge, has a huge size and a huge mass. Now, nuclear fusion is a process which, which happens with the atomic nucleus. And one knows that if you bring protons and neutrons close together, some energy is liberated which can create heat and this heat can be transformed into, well, in the sun it's kind of the light is being emitted. So called black body radiation. Wait, you bring two atoms? Uh, two, no, two nucleus. Two nucleus. Yes. So then one knows from details experiments which we have done 50, 100 years ago, mm-hmm. you know exactly, thanks to the Einstein formula E equals mc squared, mm-hmm. you know exactly how much sort of the original mass of these protons, neutrons isolated and the mass of them together mm-hmm. is slightly smaller and the rest is liberated as, as energy. Yes. Okay. About the yeah. details we can, can discuss later. So now this process, when you bring protons and neutrons together, imagine you, you know how to do it. So in the sun it's done by the gravitational force, just so strong this force that it, it brings them close together and then this nuclear force takes over and binds them. So it really needs a huge amount of energy to bring them close together? No, it's a, uh, it's a force, let's say. Okay. okay. A gravitational force. Mm-hmm. Because the protons, they have positive electric charge and they repel each other. Yes. Okay, this is an electrostatic repulsion. Mm-hmm. Now, the gravitational force brings them together. And if the gravitational force is strong enough, you overcome the electrostatic repulsion. And if they come close together, then the so-called nuclear force becomes strong enough to bring them together. And once these protons, neutrons, they form all the different elements which we know. Okay, now in order to liberate energy, you have to start basically with protons to bring them into helium. Yes. So helium is made of two protons, two neutrons, and you start with many isolated protons in the sun. Now, the idea of this process is pretty straightforward. You can do it also on Earth, in a laboratory with very few atoms fusioning, so you bring by some means you accelerate protons to a certain energy and co- collide them so they come so close together that the nuclear force dominates, mm-hmm. for example. Or you heat them up high enough that they have so many kinetic, so it's kinetic energy, they move around like, 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 like molecules in the gas mm-hmm. or like billiard balls when you, when you hit them. They Yes, around. and then they collide and... And then sometimes they come so close together that all of a sudden the sticking force brings them together. Mm-hmm. Now, the problem on Earth is you need temperatures of something like 100 million degrees Celsius. Oh, okay. <laughs> which is kind of sort, sort of high. Melting temperatures for all materials, we know the highest one is something like 3000 degrees Celsius. Yes. So there's no material which can hold these things together and bring it close enough. So therefore, one has to find some other way. So the idea of what people tried was with supermagnetic fields, in a funny way, you bring them close together. Mm-hmm. Okay, and this is supermagnetic fields, you can sort of 
they call it magnetic bottles or so, and they are trapped, the protons, neutrons are trapped in it, then you heat them up with, let's say, microwaves. It's a bit simplified, but, and by this you come to very high temperatures. Mm -hmm. All right, so then one knows what kind of isotopes are possible, so it's the so-called deuterium, and tritium is the easiest one which you can do on Earth. Mm -hmm. And this is done in the nuclear fusion bomb. But in a bomb, it's very different than if you want to have it in a, <laughs> let's say, power plant, right? You don't want that it explodes like a bomb. Yes. Yeah, you want it safe. <laughs> you want it sort of in a controlled way. Now, the big problem with this whole fusion is not only that you have to manage this kind of 100 million degree temperature yes. over a controlled time, like kind of years, and sort of in the experiments where they play around it, it has to be, I mean, some seconds or so, they get it, gets the conditions close to it, not mm -hmm. high enough, but close to it. Yes. So then there are fantastic ideas, and it costs already hundreds of billions to get in a sizable amount the temperature high enough. Mm -hmm. But this is only one of the major problems with it. So during this process of the deuterium tritium fusion, you have create some so-called plasma. And the plasma is kind of, let's say, you can imagine like a soup you boil in your, in your pot, right? And you get bubbles coming up. And when these bubbles, they come out, eventually re they leave some man-made material, right. a container. And once it reaches this, it, the splashes are so hot that they melt immediately. Yes. So you have to be very, very careful. How do you contain that? Yes, so these kind of splashes of, of plasma eruptions are basically very difficult to control. Now, they do it on a computer, and on a computer <laughs> simulation, you don't get these eruptions. Yes. Okay, so this is why they get pulses, which are very short of this high temperature. It's a, the best. Mm -hmm. Wait, okay. so like... So this is, this is the second problem to, to keep under control. Mm -hmm. so bringing it to super high temperatures, keeping these plasma eruptions under control, and then... Well, you have inside this, let's say, container, you create a high temperature and lots of energy. But then you have to bring the energy out. Mm -hmm. And how to bring this energy out to heat, let's say, some water to make steam to operate a generator, mm -hmm. the process is also unknown. <laughs> and, okay, we can go more into details of the physics, but probably it goes too far. Mm -hmm. But just for now, the, basically, it's unknown how to do it to transform this energy to a medium which can operate a turbine. So it's for the current experiments which are done, it's not a problem because they don't produce any way enough heat. So they don't even have to think about the turbine. So it's very comfortable. They only, oh no, we only work on the high temperature. Mm -hmm. Okay, then there's another problem. So deuterium tritium is the only thing you can think about fusioning. But the tritium doesn't exist on Earth because it has a very short lifetime of 12 years. Mm -hmm. And so basically, then when you go in, into details, you find out this tritium supply is impossible to get. You don't think it's possible to have no, nuclear right. fusion energy no. in the short? So, you know, it's not in the short and not in the long term. Not even in the long term. No, in the long term, you have to go to a big star like the sun, where gravitational pressure manages to, to reach these similar high temperatures. And what, like harness the energy of the sun? Well, this is what people think then, okay, if we cannot do this, we go for solar energy, taking the sun, which warms us up and so on, and you put solar panels and so on. So this is what people call about new renewable energy. Would you say that creating a nuclear uh, fusion reactor on Earth is like simulating a small, tiny sun? Exactly. And, and that's why it's like... Yes, and it's absolutely impossible. And that's impossible. And we know already. And it would be easier just to go to the sun and take the energy. Well, it comes via the, the solar radiation to the Earth. So, since this is clearly a crisis situation, in your idea, what do you think is well, a possible the, solution? The crisis situation is, so in the moment, I mean, we said, okay, we know that the, all the energy resources we use, the fossil fuels, are finite, and nobody knows exactly how finite they are, mm -hmm. but they are finite. And the byproduct is the CO2. Mm -hmm. And we know that already the atmosphere consistency of CO2 has changed so much and it actually creates this greenhouse effect and the 
global warming problem. And if you run just simple calculations and you put it on a computer and it's then still the same simple calculations, but you, you get sort of more heat absorbed from the sun and this warms up in one way or another the temperature on our planet. So this is what people think, this is a problem. Mm -hmm. Now they say, well, we, as we don't know how large the resources are, let's assume they are very large. <laughs> we can continue for a very long time. Yeah. This is what people are arguing to yes. find this. Resource problems are not an issue, therefore we don't discuss it. Mm -hmm. But the CO2, pro CO2 related problem, this is a problem and we discuss it. Mm -hmm. Is it more eminent? Is it more clearly eminent? This, the, ah. the earth is warming up. Right, this depends now. So for so this, you have to go, and I think people need to make their own analysis. So some people do it, I try also to do it, and I come to the conclusion that the real resources are far smaller than what people make us believe they are. Mm -hmm. And I can try to sort of find arguments and, and, and puts the data together in one way, which convinces me, maybe it convinces you, mm -hmm. but the power decision makers are not convinced. Right. And sort of the oil companies, let's say if you talk about oil, the oil companies are also not convinced. They say, we are clever enough, we always find more oil. And because of this, if we continue at this rate, will it, do you think there would be like a sudden surprise when there's suddenly no more oil? Or... Well, it will not happen suddenly, that the, there's not one day to another that oil is not there. Mm -hmm. Let's say sudden things comes to, let's say, warlike actions. For example, when you go, India imports quite a lot of oil from the Middle East, and then some idea is to make a blockade and that the ships from India cannot go in the direction of, let's say, India and China. Mm -hmm. Okay. So but, I mean, it had, has happened in the yeah. past that countries make a blockade, right? And suddenly don't have oil. And then the oil doesn't come, and then it's, it's very sudden. Yes. But this would be or like... Say for Europe, Europe gets, Western Europe gets lots of oil and gas from... Russia. From Russia through some other countries, through pipelines. So now if Russia says, well, okay, we have the pipelines, but we don't put it in anymore, then mm -hmm. nothing will come out. This is pretty trivial, right? Yes. So this can happen very sudden. Mm -hmm. For wh whatever reason. Good reason, bad reason, I don't know, it depends on the philosophy again. So whichever country has the resource can choose to dictate the terms? Well, some countries can. Yes, Russia can, for example. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> Would this be especially crucial when the resources start running lower? Well, I guess so. If you find resources everywhere, then you don't care if some... Yeah. Yes. I mean, if you don't want to give me your, this thing, then I get it there. Okay, so I don't care, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because you get something from me in return, maybe. Mm -hmm. But let's say you're the only supplier and, and you don't want to give it to, to me anymore. And I come with my guns and say, are you really sure that you don't want to give it to me? And then maybe you change your mind. <laughs> right? I mean, this is somehow how the world has <laughs> operated since, I don't know, a few thousand years. At least this is what a physicist learned from history. <laughs> <laughs> but in, in a general sense, like you say, it's not sudden that the oil is going to... It doesn't mean that we're, we might just find out too late to react? Okay, so now, let's say, if there's no warlike intervention, yeah. and everybody plays a fair game, mm -hmm. which is highly doubtful that people play fair games. Well, most people <laughs> play fair games. I guess we play a fair game when we play cards or chess or whatever. Mm -hmm. we try at least if there's no money involved. But when the stakes are low. When <laughs> If you just do it for fun, then okay. Yes. But global politics is another yes. story. But let's say you come into a, a situation where, let's say, we all play fair, right? Which is, doubt, is a doubtful statement yeah. that this happens on the world's scenery. Mm -hmm. But if you assume there's a fair play and sort of people would like to use oil, and so if people accept that the resource is limited, then so you, you and people want more and more of this resource. So eventually you come, you dig it out every year and you come to some kind of a maximum. Mm -hmm. And then once you have reached, let's say, half of the exploitable oil, then eventually this, I mean, you cannot dig out more because it's just not there anymore. Yes. And so this means the annual production 
cannot grow forever. Mm -hmm. So all the data indicate now that we, the growth which was observed, let's say 30, 40 years back, was 5% per year growth in this extraction. Mm -hmm. Now many countries are declining in their production or are at a, some kind of plateau-like production. They would like to grow production, but they cannot. Like they, they feel really that they're approaching the upper limit of... Yes, this is what, what it seems. When you look at, at in many regions, it's pretty obvious. So, taking all of this into account, what do you think is the solution? Is solar, geothermal, hydrothermal? Okay, What's the solution, the solution then? depends. First, you have to define what the problem is, right? Let's just say electricity for so now. My problem is I want to use as much oil as I can get. Mm -hmm. So then I use as much oil as I can get. If I can't get the oil, then I stop using oil, right? Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter if I want or not. So this is a solution to my problem. <laughs> if I'm a drug addict, right? I need to get my drug every day. Yeah. And now the, de the, the supplier is not giving me the drug anymore. You need to find another drug? Okay, this is one option. I find another drug. <laughs> or you find another supplier. Or you find a cure. Or you say no other suppliers. Okay, so the suppliers are, are not there anymore. <laughs> okay. Okay, then I either I find another drug. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Or I stop being drug, drug right. user. Mm -hmm. Go to rehab. So, now, is oil a drug? Well, I would say it looks like. Yes. Because once you start using it every day, and let's say the whole economy infrastructure is built on oil. We're dependent on it then you become dependent on it, yeah. Mm -hmm. And it pollutes the environment. Okay, well, in addition, it pollutes the environment. Yes. Now, let's say the drug addict doesn't care about the environment. <laughs> right, I mean... And what would be the equivalent of getting cured from this drug? Well, not using it, I guess. Not using But you still need electricity and energy to run society. Maybe not at the current industrial level, but some reasonable level. So what do you think right, okay. is, this is seems a, like a feasible this solution? A, this is a, let's say, philosophical question again. So, well, humans require electricity to function well. Mm -hmm. This is what some people say. So, but if you look in history books, I, I mean, electricity we use since, I don't know, 150 years mm -hmm. at most. <laughs> So from my history book, I learned that, uh, I mean, we started what, what we call culture <laughs> 5,000, 10,000 years ago. Yes. Then you find some other sort of non-written cultures, which go, I don't know, 100,000 years back. Mm -hmm. Our species, like we, is supposed to ex have existed since 200,000 years. Mm -hmm. Like it might be possible to so still... Was this not a culture or did, didn't do to these people live? <laughs> I would say, well, apparently they lived. Yeah. Yes. Not just they didn't write, they communicate, didn't communicate via complicated scriptures. Yes. For most of the time, well, they were still living. I think they were still having fulfilling lives. I can imagine that somehow it was. I mean, the, the, it seems so, right? They didn't do all suicide. Otherwise, we wouldn't be here today. If they thought. 100,000 years ago, actually, this is pretty stupid, what we are doing, let's just let's die. Well, yeah. We here today. <laughs> so, so, so there is some, some kind of contradiction with it. But now assuming you like... You can say, let's say, okay, you would like culture where you have great uh, books or so, this fantastic uh, literature achievements, I, I don't know, let's say the British talk about Shakespeare, the Germans about Goethe, and mm -hmm. in India, I don't know, some famous <laughs> writer from 2000 years ago, or, or where else, right? So it depends what you define as culture. Mm -hmm. But for, for so like, from the history books, at least in my history class in Germany, we started some 3000 years ago. So perhaps now one goes 6000 years back, because one has learned a little bit more about this ancient cultures. Mm -hmm. But at least out of these 5,000 years, only the last 100 or 150 years ago, we started to use fossil fuels and electricity and so on. And now we're dependent on it. And now we are very dependent on it. This mm -hmm. is no doubt. So we are dependent on it. But so before they didn't use it. Would the ideal solution be we just stop being dependent on so, so much energy? 
be it electrical or fossil? Well, the ideal solution, okay, this depends again on, on what you... <laughs> on the <f> philosophy you <laughs> just explained. Yeah, so you cannot, I think as a physicist you cannot answer that like this. Okay. Okay, so as a physicist, say we have to sustain the current industrial level of our society. No, we want to sustain it. We want to. Yes. So if we want to sustain it Somebody and... Somebody comes to a physicist and says we want to sustain what we are currently doing. Yes. So since we have finite resources when it comes to fossil fuels and uranium, do you think in a reasonable amount of time do we have a feasible alternative where we can shift our entire economy from being dependent on oil, gas and coal to something else? Well, okay, this is a very good question. <laughs> so I would say, when I put all of these things together, we know exactly how the different resources are and, and, and what we know today, and I believe correct decision-making should be done on what we know today mm -hmm. and not what we would like to yes. believe. So, I mean, okay, you can do religious kind of thinking politics mm -hmm. based on magic. This is what some people do. <laughs> but if you ask, let's say, a physicist or natural science motivated policy, and no, or, or based on what we know today, is there is no way, absolutely no way, to continue like we do today. And on top of it, if you have some, let's say, social egalitarian ideas, or a little bit more egalitarian ideas for the worldwide share of things, mm -hmm. But then it's even worse. Mm -hmm. So the current path we're taking is not sustainable? Absolutely. And what path should we take? What you just described, the philosophy. Right. <laughs> this, no more. This, <laughs> right, okay. So this is actually brings us to, to very deep, troubling questions. Mm -hmm. What are the, let's say, most advanced societies choosing? In what direction are they choosing? Mm -hmm. And let's say the most advanced countries in the moment, they prefer to choose by their decision-making system, they choose to, to ignore facts <laughs> and base their de leaders and their decision-making on magic. So which brings us to... So natural science is basically doesn't matter or facts don't matter. And unfortunately, this seems to be the case in the leading nations of the world or the countries which believe they should be leading the world. Mm -hmm. So if facts don't matter, it's difficult, it's difficult to argue with facts. Yes. I mean, you can, can tell the best facts and you put everything on the table, but they don't, it doesn't matter. <laughs> if people believe... Look, I am the most powerful person, and I don't care about the rest of the world. Mm -hmm. At least I can continue with this way of life some more years, and that's fine enough. And then comes magic, <laughs> and I have infinite life anyway. And then I, if it's magic, you can do everything. Wait, is, is the problem that most politicians are not physicists? <laughs> what do you say? <laughs> no, I think it's sort of... I mean, it's our belief system in certain things. Mm. Mm -hmm. So even if there would be physicists, I mean, most physicists, they don't have time to look into this, and they believe in, let's say, many scientific magic discoveries, which will come all the time. Yes. And so yes, we will manage fusion. <laughs> because if you don't manage, so this, most physicists will tell you, well, it's obvious all these other things are finite, therefore we have to work hard on f figuring out how to do fusion. And, but they don't, they don't have time to look into details. So, well, it has to work. If it doesn't work, that's the end of the world, as we know it. A kind of wishful thinking? If you want to say it like <laughs> this, I would agree. Okay. That's a good word, yeah. So, it's not only a te te technological problem. So it's a problem in the belief system yeah, as, so, so as a society. If you base something on a, on a belief system and not on facts, mm -hmm. everything is possible. Yeah. Until it is not possible. And this gets you into very abrupt changes. So which usually are 
for most people it's not what they would like to see for their for themselves or for their children. Mm -hmm. But they believe it is so far away these problems that it doesn't matter. So, bringing this very interesting discussion to a culmination, so clearly there is an imminent problem. I would like to ask you, what still makes you get up every day and work towards it? What do you tell yourself when clearly such a huge problem that... That doesn't seem solvable. Yes. Oof. <laughs> this is the most tricky question. <laughs> Let's say the simple answer... When you get older, you cannot sleep so long anymore. And you just wake up. And you just don't sleep. And you just wake up, okay? And then you find things to keep yourself busy. Mm -hmm. And some things are pleasant I can, can do, and some other things, okay, I just have to do. Mm -hmm. But this is, of course, not a good answer. <laughs> so if I could sleep longer because, I, let's say, I don't have to, to work, Mm -hmm. So I try to sleep longer and I still wake up, then okay, this is because this and that. But yeah, I could imagine to sleep like probably you do also from time to time till 10 in the morning or 11 or like my daughter still, whatever. <laughs> okay, and have, having fun at night or so. Okay, but this aside. Uh, well, during, during particle physics, I had for many years lots of fun with it. And just knowing, so I choose actually particle physics back then, because I thought, well, it's, it's interesting to, to discover something new or participate in the discovering of something new. And I'm sure no harm will be done with it. <laughs> so this was one reason why I went into particle physics. Because it's fun. It's fun to make. No, and I knew nothing bad would be done with it. Yes, oh, you couldn't okay. turn it into a weapon somehow. It can only be good. No, it can be just, it's like art, let's say. Okay. <laughs> so okay. if it's kind of the, the, the non-musician, non-painter, non-whatever artist type of things you can do. <laughs> and if you get some somewhat paid for it, then why not? Mm -hmm. But let's say out of a certain painting, you do very little harm. Yes. So now I paint or contribute a little bit in painting how the world is with understanding things, let's say, about the Higgs boson and the Big Bang and, and something like that, which mm -hmm. is fascinating. So the beginning of the universe, as we know it, is the Big Bang. Yes. To, to, to try to understand some, some parts of it. It's fascinating. It, it's fascinating, <laughs> fantastic, and I think <laughs> this kind of thinking is, is a very nice thing. Now, like art, Okay, so you, you listen to a certain type of music and you like it or you don't like it, mm -hmm. right? It's similar. Now, if the music, this type of music is not there, okay, it's okay, it's not there. So you go to some other music maybe. Mm -hmm. Now, now, so as this, I would say, I try to imagine to do this kind of data analysis in these environmental energy, energy related, related fields yes. in trying to understand how things function. And this gives me to some extent some intellectual pleasure. Mm -hmm. Developing a model on how this might go or, or kind of figuring out how to get a better insight in how large resources are, remaining resources are and how long it will take to certain things will change. Mm -hmm. Okay, so this is some kind of intellectual fun game, let's say. All right, so if you do it like this, then okay. So this is the way you stay, look at the world from outside. Mm -hmm. Now obviously, it is, I mean, we all know, we are not only looking from outside at this kind of little experiments which is happening on the planet. Yes. And this is a very disturbing thing. Mm -hmm. So, do I have a good answer for it? <laughs> but so I think, I mm -hmm. mean, drastic changes are ahead of us in many respects. Yeah. And well, I hope, would hope that a rational approach 
solve these problems might do good. You'd hope that more, more people would make more rational decisions. Yeah, that sort of rational decision based on a certain moral and ethics principles. And yes, egalitarian principles. After all, I mean, we are all, all alike. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, some are well, older than others, and, but, but otherwise, uh, the differences are not so large. Mm -hmm. And we need some basic things to, to live on, to have fun with, and so on. And, and, and well, the psychologist maybe can give some help. <laughs> <laughs> As we try to joke from the physicist's point of view from time to time. But <laughs> well, maybe one has to come back also to these ideas at some point on what makes us a satisfying way, way of life. Mm -hmm. But I don't see principle, uh, it's nice to have electricity and to play with the internet and, 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 and <laughs> use computers to, to do this and this, but I don't see it is, that it is essential. Even so, I like it and all these things I, I do, of course, like everybody else uses computers and cell phones and, 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 and well, I just start using this kind of <laughs> Smartphone. I, smartphones. <laughs> And the uh, amazing thing is one can even use it as a telephone. <laughs> <laughs> Not just for browsing Facebook. Yes. But oh. that was a very interesting discussion. We would like to thank you, Mikhail, for joining us today and l letting us know about how you view this problem. I'm sure we learned a lot and I'm sure any, everyone who's listening to this possibly Okay, Learned thank you very well. much. It was very really interesting to chatting with you about these disturbing issues. <laughs> thank you for listening. If you liked it, we'd really appreciate it if you shared it and gave us your feedback. We publish a new episode every week. For more details, visit our website simplified.xyz.